Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the third episode of Mapping Inspirational Women. And this time we have again another geographer with me today. And Mary, Mary is with me today. Would you like to introduce yourself, Mary? Sure, Hermione. My name is Marie Price. I'm a professor of geography at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And I'm also the president of the American Geographical Society. So Marie and I, we met each other, I think, in 2019 when you were in East China Normal University and I was your interpreter. We we're talking about global migration and it was a workshop targeted at uh, uh, teachers and teacher educators in China. Correct. And I was so impressed with your translation skills. I don't. And now you're studying in the UK where you've been, uh, I guess, since the pandemic. So it's really nice to see you virtually. And I look forward to seeing you again in person. Yes, I really hope that we can travel again and actually meet meet up again, talk about geography in person again. But thanks to technology, we can still meet virtually. And I really like my background. The background is an Earth Day background. I think this kind of like thing makes me feel more like nurtured, more dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked some field somewhere, so <laughs> we'll contrast each other. Yes. So, um, so the, I want to ask you, like in your life and the career, are there women that who have inspired you? That's it. That's what why I have this podcast. So I want to know about people's inspirations in their life. Uh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real, it's fun and an honor to share my experience. Um, you asked me to think about women in the past. And the thing that really struck me is there weren't really women geographers that inspired me. Um, when I was a, a young student and, and all through graduate school, I never had a single female professor. Um, it was only one visiting scholar who was from Costa Rica. And when I was an undergrad at Berkeley, she came and uh, her name was Carolyn Hall, a uh, mm -hmm. historical geographer and um, who was from the UK, but it really worked in Central America. And that was the first time I saw a woman professor in geography. Um, of course, there were women um, in the classroom, obviously, there were women graduate students, but professors few and far between, in fact, non-existent. And so I definitely remember that feeling a graduate student looking at the other women and wondering, are, is there ever going to be a place for us? Um, but geography has changed a lot, thankfully, in that regard. Um, and in fact, when I went to graduate school at Syracuse, I got this uh, graduate opportunity scholarship because at that time, women in geography were such a minority, there were federal funds to help recruit them. So we've come a long way. <laughs> um, but I will say there were a couple of women early on when I was a graduate student mm. and also um, a new professor that were really helpful. Again, there weren't many. Um, and, I, and I was fortunate, I had many excellent uh, mentors who were men who also gave me opportunities, but since we're focusing on women today, I'll talk about that. Um, one was, a, uh, and I, I did my graduate work in the U.S., so I'll preface that. Um, one was uh, Susan Hansen. I never took courses with her, but she was an economic development geographer. She also introduced um, feminist analysis to geographical scholarship, which when she was doing this in the 70s and 80s, it was very innovative. Um, and um, a couple of times in meetings, especially would be meetings and there would just be a few women in the room. I remember her coming up to me and being uh, solicitous and encouraging and, yeah. and that was really appreciative. Um, and then ironically, I had a, a advisors at Syracuse that were both men, uh, David Robinson and Don Mining. And Don Mining kind of appreciated that, wow, there are not many women around. So he told me to, uh, when I was at a conference, uh, I think in Minneapolis, to look up this 
older historical geographer who is a German American named Hildegard Binder Johnson and talked to her about her career. Um, and she passed away in the 1990s, but she had a storied career and founded the Department of Geography at McAllister doing uh, human geography, historical geography, especially of the German diaspora. Um, so at that time, I didn't realize, um, wow, this was really somebody who I've done similar work on diasporas, but I was just so excited to speak to yes. this woman who uh, who had broken down so many barriers, and yet uh, there were still so few of us uh, on the ground. Sarah also talked about Susan, but I haven't heard of this. Is it a German professor or German American professor? Uh, I think she was of German ancestry. Uh, she might have been trained in Germany. That I'm not sure to sure of. Her name was Hildegard Binder Johnson, and uh, she was uh, um, again at a time when there were almost no women in geography. I think she stood out, and she founded an important department that still has a thriving geography department. Um, there were a couple other women that I met early on, either as a graduate student or as a new professor. I've been a professor for 33 years. Mm -hmm. um, one was Vicki Lawson, who um, had a great career at the University of Washington. She's an economic development geographer, and she worked in Latin America. Uh, where I've also worked. And so she was a few years ahead of me, uh, but always gave me good advice and was supportive. And then another woman, uh, Professor Diana Liverman, who um, has had a career at many universities, but recently retired from the University of Arizona. She's really a climate scientist and deals with um, adaptation and uh, to climate change. But she is an extraordinary researcher and mentor. Mm -hmm. And even though I never took classes with her, we have I've had a refresh uh, friendship over decades. And she's always been great with advice and support. And so that um, relationship really sustained me. And then interestingly, uh, a woman who got an undergraduate degree in geography, but later became the director of the American Geographical Society uh, named Mary Lynn Bird. We first met each other at a field trip in Costa Rica. Um, she's quite a bit older than I am, but she encouraged me to join the American Geographical Society Council, which is its board. And um, that was back in 1995. And she was always sort of a champion for me to to do the work of the society, which is trying to reach to a broader audience of um, and uh, and I when I think back on it, her encouraging me to take that step yeah. um, 25 years ago was really helpful. Yes, I think there are a lot of times like you need this kind of mentor. They may not necessarily be your advisor in your research. It's a seeing them and talking to them help you to navigate around the career around it, not just about academic career, but also with influence. Can we update the images of geographers? It's not just the way the um, typical men um, yeah, with certain backgrounds, but it could be quite diverse. And mm -hmm. That's, I think, a, a theme that uh, from a discipline that was very male and very white, um, it has uh, become much more diverse, and that's such an important change. I mean, especially in the U.S. context, as our society has become much more diverse. Um, and then you asked me, uh, I mean, I really, the women who mentored me were my fellow graduate students, um, or we mentored each other. You know? Yes. <laughs> so I was with a great cohort of men and women, but the women that really, uh, when my years at Syracuse in the 1980s, when I was getting my master's and PhD, um, three women in particular, uh, Maureen Hayes, Mitchell, uh, Nula Johnson, and Susan Roberts, who all had um, 
professional academic careers. Uh, they were really good friends and colleagues, um, even though you know we've we've known each other forty years now. Um, yeah. Those relationships in graduate school actually are a, an important well in anyone's career that you go back to, and uh, these are people that have helped me think through tough ideas, and you know, help my scholarship, and and also become really important friends. So um, we're scattered; we don't live near each other, but you know, we we do get to see each other at conferences and and stay in touch by email. So that's nice. I think it's it's a different kind of mentoring. It's kind of like you can see each other when you were early career scholars and then grow with each other, see want the best for each other. Although you couldn't be like together as a graduate school, they are still mm. well connected because that's and it keeps growing. I think it's a brilliant story to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're in graduate school right now, you know, on one level. I think graduate school can be a, a very competitive environment. People are vying for attention and funds and stipends and you know posturing and seminars. <laughs> I definitely remember that. On the other hand, it is a kind of um, coming of age as you learn your scholarship through modeling and osmosis and mentoring. Um, and those people kind of know you, you know, as you continue in your career they'll they yeah. know know you from the beginning as it were and and that can yeah. be really helpful we have we have these similar things so i studied in different universities and, and i still keep in contact with my university friends like my graduate friend school friends from east china normal university and the one that i had in um ucl and currently in sterling and it's kind of like yeah the the one i have the Deep, deeper connections are always women and mm -hmm. like, especially for me I realize it's always women we kind of like we have this experience of being marginalized have this experience of knowing what it's like so you feel more connected with each other when it shows the vulnerabilities and you also see the strengths so mm -hmm. I even funded a, a project based in University of Sterling called Connected for Resilience mm -hmm. so it's kind of like a, it's a different thing it's a bit off the topic but I think what you what you have shared kind of reminds me like it's not always just a look up to the inspiration. Sometimes inspirations are around you, and they are actually the people you live with, and they support you when you are in difficulty and cheer for you when you make a lot of achievement. Yeah. Right. I I think that's um, we tend to think our inspiration is coming from above, but. Yeah. Look side to side, and that can be very important. Yes. My, as a scholar, and and um, I had an unusual experience. While I didn't have um, any female professors as an, a student, yeah. when I joined my first teaching position at George Washington, I had one other scholar. Mm -hmm. Um, who um, is a, still a friend of mine, though, though she she left academia and uh, returned to um, the, her country of birth and worked for a while in South Africa and now is back in the US. Her name is yeah. Deborah Hart. But then we, I was a, we were able to recruit um, some excellent women. And then for a, a, a string of 18 years, myself, Elizabeth Chaco and Lisa Benton Short um, ran our geography department, um, almost a matriarchy. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of unusual. There are not a lot of uh, geography departments that have been run by a string of women. And yeah. that, um, I think you're absolutely right. We were aware of being um, maybe not marginalized, but not really being um, in being a sort of a minority status, if it were, you know, as a graduate students. And so I think that sensitivity to that help shape our our leadership and and mentoring of, of new scholars. And yeah, you know, we have a very healthy, uh, diverse and, and balanced department today. And I think that um, I, I learned from their leadership strategies and and hopefully they learned from mine. They also learned from yours. And 
and this, gradually we talk about the present status, like present situation, current situation. I know you are also you're not just a professor; you're also a president of the society. I would mm -hmm. like to know, like, how do you balance this, like these two roles, and do they complement with each other? Yeah, I mean, sometimes work-life balance is not easy. <laughs> But I'm in a different stage of life, certainly than you. I've, you know, I'm towards the end of my career, and I've um, uh, done a lot of the things I've wanted to do, and I've had a, a family and raised them, and so I have a little more flexibility to take on additional uh, responsibilities. I wouldn't recommend it to somebody, uh, you yeah. know, just coming out. Um, I I will say. Uh, in retrospect, right now I'm doing um, funded research on the U.S.-Mexican border working in the lower Rio Grande Valley, mm -hmm. and it's funded by the NSF, and it's an all-woman team. There's six women, uh, Elizabeth Chaco, Sarah Blue, Jennifer Devine, Carolyn Miles, and Carla Angula Pacel, uh, and I... I, I look at that as utterly normal, but mm. when I think over the life of my career, that is totally extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> We're in this place and uh, doing um, really interesting work on this heavily securitized, um, almost militarized border with refugees and migrants trying and getting in in different ways. and. Um, it's been super challenging, but also really rewarding to work with women at, at different stages in their careers. And um, we have a very positive collaboration. Um, so I think that um, the opportunities to, to partner and collaborate with people, not even always in geography, they can be in other areas, is really vital. Um, but the the work of the American Geographical Society, I did mention, uh, I was on the council as a, ran, uh, an assistant professor, and um, that was very eye-opening to me because um, the members of the council um, were from business and from government and academia, and I was much more comfortable in the world of academics. But I quickly learned there was, uh, you know, very strong geographical work being done in in government and business and uh, and civil society. So it was really valuable and shaped my research going forward to understand that it is important for us to speak to groups beyond the academy to to engage with local governments or civil society or or um, even business sector to try to understand what are the um, big ideas and, and concerns that we can address collaboratively. And then the other goal I had as president of AGS and still have, um, I've been doing this now for six years, is to really continue to make geography and geographical research and practices, no matter the the uh, tract people go down, um, attractive to younger people and to a wide array of scholars. Um, I want the geography community that I retire from to be much more diverse and oh, inclusive. What you said that reminds me of they, this pro when I have this project, it's just a, I wonder if there's a kind of like a world map where you can click and know about women geographers around the world there, and their achievement, their contribution to it, not just in academia, but also in business, in civil service, all these kind of different things. And then I realized that hadn't been one. And of course, I'm still doing my current PhD, so I couldn't do a whole project on this. So, but I like, let's just do a side project to get mm. the wall running. And that's why I have this kind of like, I start a Google map to put them, put some people on. And I also wonder like, maybe not just the geographers, I want to put that different um, women, inspirational women from different fields. But of course my 
because my background comes from geography and it's easier for me to access with geographers and know about this. And for like you, I would say like geographer, geography, public image is very kind of like a bit ambivalent. I'm not sure if it's kind of a term. I'm not sure like people outside geography, if they haven't studied geography at university, do they understand what geographer is? Because I still remember the first conference when I went to America, there was, I was in a Uber, Uber kind of like, and the driver asked like, so why are you guys here? I'm like, yeah, we're here for a geography conference. And the Uber driver said, but haven't we discovered all the continents? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've well, been there, done that. I would say, um, I mean, your position coming from being trained in China, geography, my sense is much better understood or more fully understood in the Chinese context. And in many parts of the world, that's true. And, you know, in in Russia, people study geography, you know, all through grade school, and it's a college subject in the UK, you know, for goodness sakes, the a future king studied geography. So, um, but in America, it's still like the butt of jokes, you know, oh, don't you know where all the rivers and capitals are? And uh, on the other hand, the more work I've done, uh, not just in the university, but, you know, as I've taught more students and worked as a, uh, with AGS, I realized that there are geographers in so many areas um, doing work on climate change and urban planning and sustainability, at all scales of government. So it's uh, reassuring, even though the public perception is still uncertain uh, people that do get this training I build meaningful careers and and that gives me a lot of hope the the same like I'm actually going to Royal Geographical Society with my friend who studied uh, uh, climate change at UCL as a a master and now we are doing a session together we call mapping feminist approaches to climate change education and she said the same thing like you talk about when she entered the business sector like in the environmental consultant connotation company there are mm-hmm. actually so many different people with geography background and doing really great things for climate change sustainability and with all the planning like my mm-hmm. partner works in uh, kind of like renewable energy planning company. And they also have a lot of people from the environmental geography background that contribute into it. So there are a lot of, I would say like geographers are really good at hiding them <laughs> from the public. Maybe it's the time that we get to talk to people like, yeah, this is geography, let's update it. <laughs> exactly, because they, they, their title might not be geographer, it could be policy analyst or, you know, s- geospatial analyst or city planner, you know, but uh, they're geographers and uh, that ability to think at multiple scales and think spatially and look at human environmental dynamics. Um, I think that just gives us an edge uh, for, for you know very concrete planning jobs but also um, innovative research so it's uh, even though the pathway isn't as um, direct like I suppose if you study um, agricultural economics maybe it's a more clear path than the kind of work you would do but um, geographers make their way and uh, and do interesting work, and that's always gratifying to see that. And there is a term that I really like. I always find this kind of like a lot of geographers with internet bases called the world is your oyster. Mm-hmm. The way it does not provide such a like a direct one pathway, but it help you navigate the world, like what you, where you want to go and what geography can contribute to it. Mm-hmm. And this brings us to the last question I want to ask about, like. What about the future? Like, where, where would you imagine yourself like in the future that how we can talk if we kind of, well, let me think, how do you frame it? It's kind of like the, there will be people mm-hmm. watching a video, may not be at the same time when we record it, but in mm-hmm. the future they will, read, they will watch it because we put it online. I hope it's kind of like like open educational resources of people want to know about geography. Like, mm-hmm. what would, would you say to them? Like most people, I would imagine it could be young people or mm-hmm. it could be 
just started, started studying geography, but didn't know where were they going. And what would you say to them? Well, uh, I, I've been educating people in geography for almost four decades now. So clearly it's, a, it's something that I, I love and have um, continued to, to grow in my interests and skills. And I've never had a boring day, you know. <laughs> um, geography is always changing. I remember one of my colleagues, a historian, ironically, said to me, oh, it must be great to teach a discipline that never changes. And this was in the 1990s when borders were disappearing and new countries were forming. And I go, you've got to be kidding me. You know, do, do you read the newspaper? We're, there's a lot of change going on. And I think most people, even with climate change, while there are people that might deny it, um, you know, the evidence over and over again of more um, intense storms or fires or floods, people have begun to realize, hmm, there is a relationship between our economic activities and energy consumption and how uh, our daily lives will be impacted. And how do you adapt to that? How do you mitigate that? Um, so those are questions, that's like bread and butter questions of geography, so that there's so many ways that this training can um, um, make you a, a valuable contributor to society. Then the, the other thing is how technology has so changed how we do geography. Yes. I first learned how to draw maps with ink on a drafting table. Nobody does that anymore unless they're you know, interested in, in arcane skills. You know, the, 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 the availability of satellite imagery and remote sensing of all kinds and GIS, it's utterly transformed our discipline and, and provided um, students with skills that are extremely marketable. Um, so that's, that's another Actually, when students get that and are interested in that, they quickly see, oh yeah, there's a lot of uh, a lot of value going forward. Um, in terms of specifically speaking to students who are already studying geography, like yourself, yes. uh, when I first started, the image of a geographer was somebody who went off to the field, maybe someplace exotic and did their work alone and then they came back with their data and photos and draft maps and wrote up an article. Um, and um, that still happens, but certainly today so much more work is based on collaboration with other scholars. Yes, as a doctoral student, you have to do your own research, but um, the, the kind of big questions we need to answer whether it's reducing poverty or making the planet more sustainable or addressing climate change, those are collaborative questions that require multidisciplinary teams. And um, some of the, the really exciting work is that collaboration. And I've had many opportunities to collaborate with different scholars. I've learned with them, um, learned new skills, and um, it's just really um, critical. That's how we, we advance our scientific understanding. Not always. There are individuals that can come up with a new theory and just revolutionize things, but I think collaboration is really valuable. And then I, I've hinted at this before, but um, communicating outside of the academy, uh, talking to different groups um, like you're doing right now with this um, podcast, um, you know, you never know who you might inspire, a high school student, a third grader, um, you know, a retiree who never really thought about the world in spatial terms. And um, I think so. So like, for, just quick, remind me of like, I have a friend who never found geography interesting, but since we knew each other, and that's just like, look at the map and talk about all these things, like, oh, that's what geography is about. Mm -hmm. so, yes this kind of thing that we can do. And when I say speaking outside of the academy, I mean, there are 
uh, think tanks, not for profits, schools, I mean, big organizations like the United Nations or Brookings Institution, which is a US think tank, having worked with scholars there and produced products, it's just been, um, it, it, it reaches different audiences and, and that's very gratifying. Um, and it's a way of showing, uh, demonstrating the value of a geographic approach. The other thing I tell uh, uh, young geographers is that uh, academics tend to think, well, success is I've created a new professor. And I, I think the world is much more dynamic than that, um, that there are really exciting careers, not only in academia, but um, there, I, I live in near Washington, DC, and there are thousands of academic geographers working in the federal government in varying capacities from the State Department to U United States Geological Service to the EPA to the census. And these are impactful careers that um, change how we understand the world. Um, and then, of course, in industry, think of all the geospatial companies that are using mapping from, you know, your generation just thinks, oh, you can Google it or you can find satellite images. That's still extraordinary to me. That's not the way it was when I was coming through. So there's a, a lot of opportunities out there. Um, and then I also encourage people at the 20s are an anxious time. You know, you're, you're when someone's in going through graduate school and um, doors open and close with you know, erratically, and and I know people get discouraged, but I, I always try to encourage people. This is the long durée. It's not a sprint. You're 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 on this track for a while. There'll be different um, opportunities, different universities, different agencies you'll work with. But as long as you're asking questions and conducting research. Or, or doing projects that are meaningful to you, then it's a it's a success. It's a good career. Thank you so much for sharing all the advice and this. I hope that when our audience get this, and Mar we we put the contact in the description. And if you want to know more about American Geographical Society, it is American Geographical Society, and about Marie Marie. I'm very bad at pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> you did very well. Marie Price. Um, yeah, and please include that. And um, and if people have questions or want to learn more about the AGS, um, our, our mission is to be the foremost champion of geography for the benefit of society. So I clearly have a, um, the society has a more ambitious understanding of geography. I think it it would be nice to kind of like also check with the because if we put the link and then our audience can check with the social media or with the website to get a bit know more about it. So that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. Sounds for great. Thanks for having me and uh, good luck to you in your studies. I, maybe I'll see you on this side of the Atlantic or or your side of the Atlantic. <laughs> I do have to say, like the background of your view reminds me quite a lot of uh, where I live in in Scotland. I used to live there. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, your background um, kind of r reminds me of the Barbie movie, which is a huge <laughs> sensation right now. <laughs> I just want to see it. It's really nice, but happy to be another episode. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, 